He's not Thomas Ligotti, right? Uh, but he sure as shit ain't happy-go-lucky either. <laughs> Howdy y'all, welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. You like my skeleton? Pull them out of the closet this morning. Oh, Ooh. there you go. That's a party. Cheers. Today is Twilight by the American author William Gay, published in 2006. This was another gift from a very kind friend and author in his own right, Dana Patrick Kelly. Thanks a bunch, man. So this is a Southern Gothic novel that takes place in 1950s rural Tennessee which is where um, Mr. Gay was born and raised and died. Uh, I, I think he was born and I think he was born and died in the same town, Hohenwald, Tennessee. And if that sounds familiar to uh, Sutri by Cormac McCarthy, well, that was a massive influence on this book and Gay's writing in general. So yeah, I think there's actually even an epigraph in here from, uh, from Sutri. So there you go. It concerns the Tyler family and these two teenage siblings uh, or early 20s, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, Kenneth and Corey. Kenneth eventually just goes by Tyler. Their father, a bootlegger uh, named Moose Tyler, uh, that's what they called him, a bootlegger and a mean drunk, uh, at least to uh, Kenneth, has passed away, and the siblings have made a deeply disturbing discovery. The undertaker of the town, um, the undertaker or mortician or funeral director, or whatever you want to call him, embalmer, whatever he is, the guy who runs a funeral home and takes care of the dead bodies of all the folks who are dying in town, Fenton Brees, great name, right? A kind of soft, portly, creepy, stuffy man who lives in a mansion. Fenton Brees has been messing with the dead placed in his care. All of the corpses he buries of the people in town. It's not quite necrophilia. It's borderline sometimes. But it's just sort of like... Well, he's taking some things off others and placing them in bizarre positions on others. And then taking pictures with certain ones and I think like keeping them around for a while. And just, you know, generally molesting the deceased. So, these siblings have dug up some graves and discovered he's done this to not just one, but like a bunch of them. And like thrown trash in there and just kind of like neglected everything like intentionally. Just gross shit, you know? Just kind of hideous, disrespectful, nasty stuff. Kind of a, we assume is sort of like a, um, his way of kind of just getting revenge on the town for, you know, ostracizing him socially. So, these siblings have discovered this and then, um, Tyler, the brother, uh, manages to steal a briefcase uh, from Fenton out of uh, his car, out of Brees' hearse. And inside are a whole bunch of self-portraits with these corpses that Brees has taken in various obscene poses. And Corey, the sister, uh, gets it in her head to uh, blackmail him for a decent, but not, you know, not crazy, but decent sum of money, especially for those days. And it really wouldn't, you know, it, with the amount of wealth that he had, he was like born into it. His father was rich and, you know, Fenton grew up rich. So he's this mansion. And so it's very, very wealthy. And it wouldn't really make much of a difference. But, you know, it's still, you know, it's a decent chunk. But, you know, Brees, Fenton suspects that, you know, she won't just stop with the photos, right? Um, it'll just keep going and going. And, you know, he's probably right, you know. His secret's out. Pretty good setup, right? Well, Brees decides to hire somebody to get these photos back. Uh, by any means necessary, it sounds like. A local sleazy, twisted, but unfortunately all too capable individual <laughs> by the name of Granville Sutter. Again, kind of the Sutter reference. Who we first meet after he leaves jail when he decides to get revenge on one of the jury members responsible for placing him there by first insulting and harassing his wife then waiting for the guy to show up at Sutter's house and then shooting him in the head, just shooting him in the head with a shotgun and making it look like the guy was trying to attack him with a fire poker, right? You know, an iron fire poker or whatever it's called, which he intentionally places in the wrong hand of the corpse, you know, as though he'd been attacked, but he, but he intentionally placed it in the wrong hand just to see if he could get away with it in court, which he does because everybody's terrified of him. Anyways, back to The Undertaker. Uh, so, Fenton makes a deal with this guy, you know, get the pictures, get paid. So Sutter being what he is, he takes things too far, right from the get-go, gets somebody killed, I won't say who, and Tyler is left running from Sutter through the backwoods, descending into this recurring fictional place in Gay's writings, this sinister topography created by Gay called the Hurricane, which I believe is based off this real place, like an, uh, an overgrown, abandoned mining town in Tennessee. Speaking of topography, Today's episode is brought to you by the Ridge Wallet. 
These things are awesome. They are light, sleek, industrial, beautiful little pieces of minimalist modular design. Very easy to use, holds up to 12 cards plus room for cash on the back. This one's got a little cash strap. You can also put in a cash clip if you prefer. These are meant to go in your front pocket or your side pocket, not your back pocket. Please don't sit on them. It's not that it's gonna break, it's just that it will not feel good at all. This is the topographic model. This is the Yosemite one, I believe. This is my favorite, but there are also these others, the Narrows, as well as this blue one called North Shore. They also carry these awesome titanium pens for all you writers out there. This one is black. Very cool indeed, and you press this down like a rifle. It also comes in this gunmetal color, which is appropriate. I don't know how on earth you're gonna break that thing, but good luck. The durable material means that each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. You can buy this one wallet and carry it for life. In fact, the Ridge team is so confident you'll like it, they'll let you test drive it for 45 days. You can send it back for a full refund if you don't love it. It's a great policy. And if that hasn't convinced you yet, check out their 40,000 five-star reviews. Get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping returns by going to ridge.com forward slash better than food and tell them I sent you by using the code better than food and then getting 10% off. The link is below. Thanks a bunch. Happy Halloween. It's called the Hurricane because as the story goes, a storm came in and tore the place up, creating this bizarre, deep, dark labyrinth in the woods, wherein few eccentric personalities still exist. Hurricane, hurricane, southern accent, get it? So yeah, that's basically the gist of the plot, you know? It's weird though, it's it's like a myth or a fairy tale or something like that. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of nonsensical some, to some degree. There are plot issues all over. Things really don't add up, and, and I don't think they're supposed to. And there are feats of human endurance or, you know, violence or escapes that are just downright, you know, unbelievable. It's not realism. It's, it's more of like a Southern Gothic myth. It's not meant to play by all the rules, but most of them. Enough so that you kind of believe it. I think it'd make a great TV series. This is the first book I've read from Gay. I've, I've uh, heard about him for a while now. Um, this was the one that um, uh, Dana suggested I start with. And, uh, you know, perfect for the season, you know, Halloween. I've taken an interest in him over, uh, over the course of the last year. I've been looking forward to reading him as uh, he's an interesting specimen. He didn't publish anything until he was well into his 50s, like 57. Like he was approaching 60 by the time he, he published his first uh, short story, I think. Um, which is, uh, I think that was one called I Hate to See, I Hate to See That Evening Sun Go Down. Uh, which I haven't read, but it looks, it looks really good. It's about a, a fellow who's uh, placed in a nursing home and uh, realizes that the world basically just doesn't care about um, the kind of vessel of knowledge that he is, like that has been relegated to the dustbin, so to speak. And that was that's really compelling to me, that whole uh, premise. So I want to read I, I want to read that. But uh, yeah, anyway. But then you know that that kind of launched his uh, career, so to speak. He was kind of a hermetic guy uh, from Tennessee who who worked blue collar jobs his whole life. Worked as a carpenter, then hung drywall, and then he started a painting business with his sons. He had kids, so he had to take care of them, you know? So he chose that life and, and then did the writing thing later. But he never stopped. He'd been writing since he was 15. I really admire that kind of thing because he's already, you know, he, he already lived a life, you know, maybe a few, honestly, before his life became that of a full-time writer. I don't think there's anything wrong with that for all of you aspiring young writers out there. Not that I'm any authority whatsoever, but uh, you know, just my personal opinion. I think it's far better to have something to say rather than try and come up with it because it sounds cool, right? Or, or you know, the, the, the writing life sounds cool. Um, I know there's a lot of money in it, but. <laughs> <laughs> so take note, you know, if you're in your 20s or 30s or even, hell, even 40s, and feel disappointed with your lack of output or, you know, your quality thereof. <laughs> I'm not talking about myself at all. Now he was writing since he was 15, so you know if you started, don't stop. Just get better and go live your damn life. Today also would have been, I believe, his 81st birthday, so happy birthday to you, Mr. Gay. Hope you're celebrating on the other side. Gay writes quite a bit, and I think this is probably like his signature, right? He writes quite a bit about the, uh, the gorgeous Tennessee landscape. He loves writing about landscape, like weather and nature and birds and trees and all this stuff. Um, he said in an interview, I've linked below, I think writers have to have a touchstone. The rural landscape is mine. Sometimes I write scenes just to get to write a summer storm. And yeah, that's, that's definitely apparent when reading the book. Um, other books that were sort of like that, I think The Sound and the Fury was like that. Suchery by McCarthy, definitely. Um, yeah, that's probably the closest comparison that I, can, that I can think of. So as far as how the narrative goes, you know, I was wondering the entire time, uh, you know, what it was gonna be like, you know, what, how, how pessimistic or how dark was this gonna get, right? How far is Gay gonna go? 
Um, so you have the potential, you know, with all these chess pieces on the board, so to speak, for everything to work out okay. A couple of times I thought things are going to be all right. There's some interesting scenes, you know, with uh, Tyler running through the backwoods and just meeting character after character, uh, and just seeing these personalities. But yeah, Gay's too real. You know, he's too, he, he's too realistic to make it all right, you know, to have a happy ending, so to speak. Gay has too much of a sense, I think, of what small town hard life actually does to people. How things really turn out in the end. He has too much of a sense of what reality is uh, for there to be a, a, a truly happy ending. That isn't to say that it's all bad. It's not, you know, it's not like everybody dies. It never is really all bad, except in some circumstances, of course, but those are kind of exceptional. What I mean to say is he doesn't go out of his way to paint a uh, pessimistic, bleak vision of the world. He's not Thomas Ligotti, right? Uh, but he sure as shit ain't happy-go-lucky either. <laughs> and what I really enjoyed about the novel was um, Gay's ability uh, to get you to see it from the bad guy's point of view. Even Sutter, you know, the, the evil hitman. Somewhat, you know, within reason. There's a whole gap there, you know, about personal choices and free will and what have you. But um, one of the creepiest scenes in the book uh, is one, and you know, you've heard the plot, so that's saying something, is a flashback to uh, Sutter's nightmarish childhood when his mother, who, is, who seems to be in the process of losing her mind, is sitting on the edge of his bed, watching him sleep all night, holding a butcher knife. That'll change you. Judging from his upbringing and also his state of mind, it's understandable. That's what great writing is all about, frankly. Empathy. And especially empathy with very, very dark characters. Or just characters who are so vastly different than yourself that you would never, ever want to um, associate with them in real life or you just wouldn't because you're just so vastly different. Um, you know, that's what writing is about. It's about understanding uh, all of the different paths that encompass this, uh, this concept that we have called human experience, right? of which there are just an endless amount of permutations. That's all of writing, you know? That's all religious texts, that's just everything. Um, that's what it's all about. That's what great writing is all about, empathy. Even with Fenton Brees, you know, the, uh, the weird undertaker, keeping the corpses around, dressing them up, drinking cognac with them and discussing Mahler, <laughs> lounging in his salon with classical music in the background, y you get it. it. Sure goes to a lot of effort. It's very reminiscent of some, uh, some contemporary-ish uh, serial killers, uh, such as, you know, Dennis Nilsson in the UK, or Jeffrey Dahmer in America. Of course, he's, he's gotten very popular recently. Again, guys who murdered other people to have control over them, but also just to, like, you know, to have somebody to hang out with, ultimately because they're very lonely men. Well, in Dahmer's case, hungry, too, so that old chestnut. But just listen to this bit about Sutter when he's chasing Tyler deep in the hurricane. Where are we going? 139. 139, okay. He, he's sleeping in the woods. Basically, you know, he's got his gun and he's just sleeping there in the woods chasing Tyler. He's having a nightmare that his mother is uh, slitting his throat. Lying there sleeping on the mossy concrete, his face jerking with the troubled passage of his dreams, he is provisionally still brother to all humankind. He has strayed far from the ways of men, but there has always been a kind of twisted logic to his violence. The things he desired and struggled for made a kind of sense. Revenge, avarice, a thirst for power, the things only dreamed by normal men. Their own secret thoughts made carnet and ambulatory. Silver threads, thin and frayed though they be, hold them yet to the ways of the world. Here in the night they part, and the ties give one by one, and he falls away like some winged predator into another country, dark and unmapped and turbulent, so that he is finally free from all restraint. Lost. It's good. So yeah, of course what immediately comes to mind is Cormac McCarthy, Flannery O'Connor, and William Faulkner. If you're into any of those authors, you might want to grab this one. It's not nearly as heavy as the three, but it's also not so light that you won't notice the influence of their exemplary styles. Stephen King has a blurb on the cover comparing it to uh, No Country for Old Men and Deliverance. Then double the impact, he says. Yeah, right. It's funny. William Gay was uh, subscribed to Entertainment Weekly, and uh, in 2007 when the book was published, uh, <laughs> Stephen King had listed his uh, top 10 books of the year or whatever, and uh, William Gay's Twilight was number one for him. Stephen King called it the best book of the year. And so, you know, as William's reading it through, he gets to number one and it's him. It's like, so. There's definitely a good sense of humor to the whole thing as well. I'd never call it a comedy, but there's definitely a good line thrown in every now and then to cut the tension. It's the same humor too that you'd 
find amongst like, you know, seasoned blue collar workers. You know, these guys who just slip in an unbelievably brilliant piece of dry humor into a conversation or, or as a retort, almost like they were, like they were born with the skill, right? Uh, that type. The kind of stuff that should be written down but never is. I don't, I don't know how else to say it. There's just like, there's just like guys out there that, who just really have a knack for it. Or they've just been around these other guys their whole life and they know the patterns and they can just say these lines that are just absolutely hysterical and funnier than anything you'd see in a film or read in a book. So it's that kind of humor. It's very simple, uh, but it's very, very clever. Is it better than food? Um, I mean, like I love that passage. I love a lot of things in the book, but not quite, not quite for me. Almost, but not quite. If you're really into Southern Gothic fiction, you should enjoy this. If you liked Faulkner's As They Lay Dying, or Cormac McCarthy's Sutry, or Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man Is Hard To Find, or Wise Blood, I'd give this one a shot. And if you enjoy The Devil All The Time by Donald Ray Pollock, I'd say this is absolutely right up your alley. It's actually uh, better, I think. And so I feel a little bit of guilt when I say that this isn't better than food, when I call The Devil All The Time better than food. But that's just what happens, right? The more you read, the more you need to be impressed. And I don't have kind of like a sliding scale system. I really, I kind of kick myself for that sometimes. Like I don't even have like a one to five or like, you know, one to 10. I kind of would have done that. If I were to like give like a one to 10, I would say this is probably like a seven, you know? It's good, but I wouldn't reread it. Unless I really, really wanted to read something about the rural Tennessee landscape, then I would grab this without a second thought. And I assume probably a lot of the rest of uh, William Gay's writings as well. So what did I dislike? Well, you know the feeling when you're on a hike or you're in the woods and you're taking in so many things with your eyes. It's dizzying, like, you know, the foliage and the rocks and the animals and the sky and all these branches and all this grass and all these plants. It's like, it's, it's so intricate, it almost gives you a headache looking at it. That's what reading gay is sometimes like for me. While his love for writing about nature and the woods and the birds and so on is really instrumental and, and effective for developing a vibe and atmosphere, it's just totally unnecessary sometimes and drags, drags the whole thing down, drags the whole story down in my opinion. Um, and I feel it didn't have to be that way. And it really wasn't, he didn't, he wouldn't have to take out that much. And I read an interview, you know, after I read the book and I, and I, I think possibly after I wrote this, where he, uh, said that was the issue that he had, I think, with um, publishers, uh, was that they were complaining that there was too much of this. And uh, there is. It's, it's just, I mean, that's my opinion. There is. It just is not pleasurable to read. It was clearly pleasurable for him to write, but for me, it was like, I get it, man. Got it. <laughs> Moving on. I really do think that he could have tied up a lot of plot holes better uh, and focused less on the, um, um, the, the landscape portrait. The Peregrine, J.A. Baker's The Peregrine, also suffered from uh, a similar excessive infatuation with the landscape. Of course, that was um, uh, rural England, not uh, Tennessee. But then I'm sure people love these books for this reason, right? Not me. I'm sure Faulkner does the same thing, and, and certainly McCarthy and Sutri probably, you know, but, uh, but God, sometimes these guys, I'm just like, all right, it's dark, it's beautiful. Moving on, for the love of God, please. And there were definitely some, you know, yeah, right moments with the plot. Um, probably the part that uh, there was an escape that does seem directly out of deliverance, which is what, you know, King was probably thinking of when he wrote that blurb, which is like, definitely, yeah, right. So you'll, you'll know what it is when you read it. But yeah, I guess the whole like Southern Gothic fairy tale thing sort of just, it's supposed to alleviate that or something, but yeah. And also that whole like, <laughs> yeah, there's just some stuff that's completely unbelievable. Um, in particular, the way that Gay sets up Granville waiting for Tyler in the Ackerman's Field courthouse in an homage to Little Red Riding Hood. I mean, sure, it's gloriously demented, no question. And it is interesting, but it's ridiculous. I mean, it is kind of a comedy at the end of the day. And there's a few of those moments in the book where it's like, yeah, that needed development. There's a lot of dream sequences. Shrug. It's kind of a cop-out, I think. Just me personally, I just dream sequences. He really set up a lot of potential outcomes with the characters, but they just didn't go anywhere. There are definitely some dead ends in the novel, and that is not a pun. It seems to me, at least. But that's also, you know, you could argue that's pretty much true of real life as well. And that's, you You would not be mistaken. Is it better than food? No, not quite. The more you read, the more you need to be impressed. So, hey, coffee time.
For those of you who are new, thank you very much for stopping by and watching. I take the names of all the Patreons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show, I place their names in this mason jar, and for every review I do, I pull out a name, and whoever wins is sent a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. And the coffee is delicious. If you would like to get in on that and help support the show, you can click on the link below or go to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and donate $5 or more per video, and I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you. And by donating a dollar or more, you'll get access to all the cool stuff listed below. Please check it out, and thank you very much. And also, just to reiterate one more time, international shipping is now included. Thanks a bunch. Any Misfits fans out in the audience? I'm sure there are. Danzig only, of course. Uh, you know, my favorite version of Halloween is actually Halloween 2, uh, done by Samhain, which is uh, Danzig's metal project between, you know, uh, Misfits and Danzig. They do like a slowed down metal version of Halloween 2. I think you can find it on YouTube. They don't even have it on Spotify. But uh, that, I think that's from the album November Coming Fire. And uh, that is a sick track. If you want to bust out another couple reps in the gym. Thank you very much to all the patrons and best of luck. Okay, here we go. Robert! Robert W. Awesome. Thanks a bunch, Robert. Really appreciate it. Hope you're doing well. You're gonna receive Twilight by William Gay, plus a bag of coffee, and I hope you love both. Robert and I have spoken quite a bit, he's got great taste, and uh, I think, I think this will be up your alley, man. Cheers. Please subscribe if you have not already, and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this, and always remember, die reading. Right? Right. Right. And also, yes, McCarthy's The Passenger is on its way. Finishing it up now, and enjoying it so far. What are you reading this Halloween season? Let us know below, and let us know if it's good, or good so far. Alright, take care of yourselves, have a great night, talk to you soon. Happy Halloween. Ciao.